I am not a historian, but neither are you. So, how about we the people learn this stuff together? Welcome to US 101. Yeah, they say that you're supposed to dress like a teacher. But a, you like this jacket? I don't think it's a little, it's a little weird in the sleeves. With much of the news focused on Trump's recent ban of refugees from seven predominantly Muslim countries, I wanted to take today's episode and focus on an American symbol of hope for newly arrived peoples to the United States. Of course, I'm referring to the Statue of Liberty. And let me guess, you probably think that you already know the basic story behind Lady Liberty, right? She was, a, she was a gift from France to the United States. She's on Liberty Island, which is this tiny, tiny island between New York and New Jersey. And all ships sailing into New York have to pass her, which grant immigrants and refugees their first glimpse of America via the statue. It's all very romantic. But there's actually a bit more to the story behind the statue. Like, for example, it wasn't a gift from France to the United States. And for that matter, it almost wasn't put on Liberty Island. Let me take you back to where it all started in 1865 in France, where Frenchman Edward de la Bolle is discussing with French sculptor Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi about how he wants to celebrate America's centennial of its independence by building some sort of sculpture to commemorate the event. And how fortuitous that these two gentlemen would be discussing this very idea because at the same time, Bartholdi is planning on building a large lighthouse in the shape of a woman holding a torch and he wants to place this lighthouse at the mouth of the Suez Canal in Egypt. And he pitches them the idea, hey, I want to build the statue of a woman holding a torch put at the mouth of the Suez Canal. I think it'd be really cool. And Egypt is like, mm, nah, it's a nice idea, but mm, there's no need for it. So Bartholdi and La Bolle decide who else could benefit from a statue like this, from a lighthouse like that? Let's go to America. America would, they, 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 they would totally want this. So Bartholdi packs his bags and he sails to America. And as he's sailing to America, as he's sailing into New York, he passes a small spit of land by the name of Bedloe's Island. And when he gets to New York, he meets with some top end financiers. And he ends up actually having a meeting with President Ulysses S. Grant, pitches him the idea about the statue. And then he also says, you know what? I saw this small island out in the water, Bedloe's Island, I think it's called. Yeah, I think that'd be the perfect spot for it. And Grant agrees. Yeah, we'll take it. Let's have a statue. But before you can build a statue that big, you obviously need the tools and the material. Now, how do you go about getting the tools and the material? You need money. And since these guys didn't have money just laying around to build a 150 foot tall statue, they needed to raise the funds. So La Bolle goes ahead and forms what's called the Franco-American Union. And he says that France will pay for the statue if the United United States pays for the pedestal that the statue will stand on. But the thing is, is that Americans weren't initially all that thrilled about pitching money towards a pedestal for a statue that they haven't even seen yet. It just sounded kind of like a, like a silly, I'm going to give you money to build a pedestal for What if the statue sucks? But who would step in to save the fundraising efforts on the American end? That would be Joseph Pulitzer or Pulitzer if you want to say it properly. So Pulitzer comes up with the following idea. He makes an announcement. He says, for anyone that donates money towards the pedestal, regardless of how much or how little, I will print your name in the New York world. You will be listed as a donor towards the statue's pedestal. And naturally, the donations came rolling in. Why? Because it's still f cool to see your name in the paper. As for the building of the statue, which finally began in 1875, Bartholdi decided that he wanted to build the statue out of copper. But here's the thing. If you're going to build a statue that's over 150 feet tall, building it just out of copper is going to make it very flimsy and is not going to hold up to the elements very well. What the statue needed was a strong interior skeleton made out of a material like iron to help it stand tall and at the same time to help it brave any and all elements that are going to batter the statue over the years. So Bartholdi reaches out to a French engineer by the name of Alexandre Gustave Eiffel, whom you may know from this small structure. I don't know how well known it is, but it, that's the guy that, that built that structure. Now, prior to its completion, parts of the statue were made available for viewing to the public to draw up more support and more funds. In 1876, just the arm holding the torch was on display in Philadelphia, and there was such an overwhelming response to the torch arm that Bartholdi, for a moment, considered putting the statue in Philadelphia instead of New York because he saw how crazy the crowd went over just an arm 
farm. Not to mention that at one point, when fundraising had sort of slowed to a crawl in New York, another city decided to put its hat into the ring to take the statue, and that city was Boston. Which would kind of make sense. Boston, essentially being the home of the start of the Revolutionary War, would kind of make sense that the Statue of Liberty would have a home in Boston, especially if the statue was meant to celebrate uh, America's independence. But the New York Times was not having any of that. The New York Times stopped Boston dead in its tracks when it wrote the following in an editorial. Boston has probably again overestimated her powers. This statue is dear to us, though we have never looked upon it, and no third-rate town is going to step in and take it from us. That great lighthouse statue will be smashed into fragments before it shall be stuck up in Boston Harbor. The statue was completed in 1884 and shipped over to the United States in 1885, and it's said that when the ship carrying the crates holding the statue parts made its way into the New York Harbor, around 200,000 people showed up to see it dock. As for the pedestal that was going to hold the statue, financing for it was completed in 1885, and it was fully built in 1886. And on October 28, 1886, a dedication ceremony was held on Bedloe's Island, and it was led by President Grover Cleveland, who was also a former governor of New York State. And it is the Statue of Liberty Enlightening the World which is the statue's full name, by the way, that has served as a beacon of hope and dreams for immigrants and refugees coming to the United States. It is that statue that also served as a lighthouse for sailors in the night until 1901. And it is that statue that bears the words of a sonnet called The New Colossus, written by poet Emma Lazarus on its pedestal. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I'd like to think that those romantic images of immigrants and refugees seeing the Statue of Liberty for the first time is what inspired federal judge James Robart to put a halt on Trump's refugee ban. I'd like to think that those words in Lazarus' sonnet are what inspired the Department of Homeland Security to suspend Trump's refugee ban. And I'd like to think that the thousands and thousands of people that protested at airports all across the country had the statue in mind because they know what it stands for, they know what it represents, and they believe that it can still stand for hope and dreams for people coming to America to find a better future for themselves. And let me be very clear with you, okay? The US is nowhere near perfect, okay? You just look at our history and you will see time and time again that we have royally f***ed up. But the reversal of this ban and the outcry of so many American citizens wanting to embrace the refugees coming to our shores to try to make a better life for themselves, that is what fills me with hope. And that is what fills me with the belief that regardless of whatever obstacles are in the way of the United States, we will continue to overcome them. And that, my friends, is it for this episode of US 101. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And thank you to all of you that uh, recently over the past week have subscribed to the channel, man. What? I cannot believe how many of you guys have been subscribing. Thank you so much for checking out the videos and for subscribing and hopefully learning a little bit more about American history. I am touched. And as always, guys, make sure to check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash USA History 101, where you can check out previous episodes as well as some interesting articles or articles that I find interesting about American history. Hopefully you'll find them interesting too. Thank you guys so much for watching and we will see you again next Tuesday for an all new episode of US 101. Until then, we are all done. And again, no hate, no fear. Immigrants and refugees are all welcome here. See you guys next week.